Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Timothy Lee. I'm a research analyst with Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on gold exploration and development today. We will hear from Alexander Scanlon, Managing Director and CEO of Barton Gold Holdings Limited. During today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook. Then we will take questions. Uh, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we will get to as many as we can. Before we kick things off, first, we need to discuss some fine print. Uh, during this Barton Gold webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the company's forward-looking statements disclosure outlined on page two of the Barton corporate presentation, and that can be found on the company's website, bartongold.com.au. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors, and participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures pertaining to Barton. Uh, so we have Barton Gold presenting today. The company is focused on gold exploration and development in South Australia, where it's built a portfolio of projects, uh, including a mill, excellent infrastructure, uh, a sizable resource, but plenty of exploration upside potential as well. Uh, we initiated coverage on Barton this morning uh, with a buy rating and a 70 cent Australian target price. With that, I now turn it over to Alex to update our audience on the company. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, as, as many of you will know, we've just put out a resources upgrade. So we've got a presentation that sort of walks through, again, the, the high level of Barton Gold, who we are, what we do, uh, talks about what this upgrade is, what it means for us in terms of our Tonkelia project, and then actually looking back at the broader Tonkelia project and how that fits together with Tarkula which is a neighboring asset, which is actually contains the home of high grade gold in South Australia, how these things fit together, how we see them potentially unfolding in sort of a staged de-risk development strategy over the course of the next uh, several years, and how that gets us to our objective of being, on the one hand, South Australia's largest uh, independent gold producer, uh, and two, a production target in the vicinity of 150,000 ounces per annum. So with that, I'll take us into the presentation and starting at the top there, um, for those of you who are, are, are you know, not familiar with Barton Gold or just as a refresher, you know, who we are, uh, what are we doing, why are we doing that, and, and what has been kind of the, the pace and direction so far. Uh, we are a pure play gold, pure play South Australian developer. So uh, we're not focused in multiple jurisdictions. We don't have various different assets in our portfolio that we need to maintain in terms of tenement costs or other legal uh, legal or, or project costs in uh, different countries, different states even, uh, or different metals. We are focused very much in the central Gullah Creighton of South Australia. And South Australia is a very interesting state to us when we think about the investment opportunity, uh, because as a country, Australia is one of the top three largest gold producers uh, annually. <clears throat> the state of South Australia contains 25% of Australia's known gold resources, uh, but South Australia speaks for only about 2.5% of annual production. And so there's this mismatch between the geological strength of the state, which is basically 50% covered by the renowned Gullar Creighton. Uh, so there's this mismatch uh, in theory between that geology and that production. And that really reflects a very strong legacy for the past 30 to 40 years of investment in copper and uranium. So South Australia is kind of the Chile of Australia. We are a major copper exporter, uh, and we are also a significant uranium exporter. And that has reflected in the very heavy investment around BHP's Olympic Dam asset, uh, a company called Oz Minerals until recently had both Prominent Hill and Carapatina. And so these are three assets, Carapatina, Olympic Dam, and Prominent Hill in an IOCG province right in the center of South Australia. <clears throat> BHP consolidated Oz Minerals, and therefore they've consolidated the IOCG district to the west in the same basin, but where it becomes shallower, uh, there is a, an historic 130-year-old high-grade gold-producing district called the Central Gala Gold Province, 
uh, it is parallel to the IOCG province. And what we have done is essentially to consolidate every significant historical exploration and producing asset in that province. Uh, we've bought the only gold mill in the region. We have stepped back rather than kind of rushing things into small scale production, which is sort of a, a continuation of the, the, the legacy in the, in the area for about 130 years. We've stepped back. The strategy is to identify and build multiple new regional geological models, bring in a lot of new technology to accelerate and unlock exploration and target a multi-million ounce resource base from which we can turn on long-term sustainable production at around 150,000 ounces per annum. So the news for us uh, quite, uh, quite recently, uh, Monday this week, is that we did release another resource update this year. So it's the second uh, this year for the Tonkilia project. That now takes us to about a 1.5 million ounce uh, portfolio uh, for Barton Gold in this region. <clears throat> so we're really building up a very strong platform uh, we're building and leaning into and continuing real momentum in this. Uh, and of course, we're you know really focused on building awareness, uh, both domestically and internationally of the South, South Australian opportunity, uh, but then also bringing the story into North American and European markets where we're starting to get a lot of support and a lot of interest from sort of institutional and sophisticated investors. So um, with that, uh, we're you know, looking, looking into the capital structure, uh, where we sit today, we're about a, a 25 Australian cents per share company. Uh, that puts us in the vicinity of about a 50 million Australian dollar market cap. Uh, or for those who think of, uh, think of in terms of US dollars, <clears throat> but let's say a 35 million dollar uh, US dollar market cap. And uh, as of the 30th of September, we had 9.3 million dollars in cash. And we also have about $4.3 million worth of gold in concentrates, which is part of our asset monetization programs, which I'll discuss a little bit more as we go through the presentation. <clears throat> but one thing that makes us uh, perhaps unique in the industry is that we have a series of assets. We've not only bought a mill, we've not only bought some brownfield mines, we have a whole bunch of equipment that is surplus to our strategy, which is, a, a, which is an evolution of what was done in the past. Um, we have disposed of surplus camp that's non-core to us, surplus assets. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, of sort of grant uh, and, and tax credit support for the company. And we also actually monetize our assets through you know, mill, cleaning out our mill uh, in preparation for optimization. And that, for example, has yielded uh, nearly $6 million worth of gold for us over the past two years, uh, about $4.3 million, which we still hold uh, for sale presently. <clears throat> so. As we've gone and done these things, uh, really over the past year or a little bit more than a year, we've seen uh, Barton Gold as a story in the market really springboard away from the market trends. Uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, we uh, catalog Barton Gold against both uh, the gold price uh, and GDXJ, so the Vanek Junior Producers Index. And of course, Vanek Junior Producers, these are sort of one, two, three, five billion dollar companies. Um, both gold and Van Eck are up about 20% uh, since the beginning of November last year. Uh, and we are up uh, more around 70% during that time. So <clears throat> we've really sort of broken away from and, and, and stepped away from, uh, from, from the market. Uh, and part of that reflects a couple of things. One, this ongoing performance, which ties to a team that is, uh, I think, quite well pedigreed, quite well experienced in doing what we do. Uh, but also is very strongly aligned to exactly these outcomes. So board and management speak for about 23% ownership of the business. Uh, and we have seen institutional support uh, of, of Barton Gold uh, really in, uh, strongly increase during the past uh, 12 months or so. Um, we have about 22% uh, institutional and corporate ownership. And then a number of these institutions are, in fact, specialist gold investment funds. So funds that are not only resources investors, but in fact, specialize in sort of picking the right teams in the right jurisdictions in the right moments to focus on developing gold assets. And that's where you see uh, groups like Merck's uh, Gold Fund, that's the a uh, ASA Gold Fund out of the United States, uh, Ixios, uh, their Gold Fund out of Paris, uh, Argonaut Gold Fund is a new gold fund launched by a uh, sister enterprise of Argonaut Securities uh, in Australia. Uh, Collins Street is a, a, a private equity fund out of Melbourne. Uh, and then we have you know, Mercer Street, Ballingall, 
uh, out of North America and uh, Hong Kong, London, and then several others who request not to be named. But we've seen that sort of institutional ownership go from about probably 10 to, to, to nearly getting close to 25% now uh, over the past six to nine months. So it's a very strong endorsement of what we're doing. Uh, and of course, we'll be looking to continue that success and, and, and earn that into the uh, 2024 year. When we think about uh, the, the company's capital structure, for us, really human capital is at the core of everything. So I talked about that very strong alignment and that, that particular pedigree. Uh, when we look at the company's leadership team, uh, just the, the sort of senior most leadership in the company uh, on this page represents uh, well north of 200 years of experience exploring for permitting, financing, building, operating, and optimizing resource assets uh, with a very strong pedigree in South Australia and gold. And so if you look at the page carefully, about half of our senior team are formerly uh, of Normandy mining. Uh, Normandy was Australia's largest gold producer uh, into the early 2000s. They were producing about 2 million ounces of gold per year, which uh, even in today's more consolidated market, that, that in, unto itself would be one of the world's largest gold producers still. Um, today, everyone is talking about Newmont mining buying Newcrest mining in Australia. Originally, uh, 22 years ago when they entered Australia, they did so by buying Normandy. So Ken Williams, our chairman, was the former CFO of Normandy. Uh, David Wilson, Mark Twining, our GMs of uh, projects and exploration, also formerly Normandy and then Newmont. We have specialists who, who have focused on IO, the IOCG and gold systems of South Australia for the past 30 years of their lives. Uh, we have tier one corporate governance expertise and the former general counsel of Santos Limited. Uh, and we have somebody uh, in, in Graham Arvidsson who actually specializes in optimizing and building mills and building teams around mills to get the most out of them because that's where, of course, we find uh, successes or failures when you actually turn on uh, when you actually turn on mines. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, this is a team that reflects our forward ambition. And coming back to that, you know, what is that for us? That is to take these assets, develop them in a staged, lower cost, lower risk uh, approach, leveraging our existing infrastructure with the objective to be South Australia's largest independent gold producer. And that for us is about 150,000 ounce per annum uh, target. What we are focused on uh, in terms of mineralization for that is really looking for open pit mineralization. So we favor open pit uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, it is more technically simple to operate, but it is generally speaking cheaper, faster, simpler, and safer to explore for, develop, and operate. <coughs> Big pardon. And two, uh, sort of the second key feature about open pit mining versus perhaps underground mining, uh, which Australia does do very well. <coughs> Big pardon. <clears throat> which Australia does do quite well, is you can get efficiencies of scale in your open pit mining that you can't necessarily get in underground mining. So where we're looking here when we look at our project map is really our Tarkula and our Tunkelia projects. And so these are the two assets you see uh, highlighted in orange, uh, sort of on the bottom half of this picture. Now, these are two project platforms that together uh, have around uh, 3,000 square kilometers of ground. So very, very prominent ground positions. Um, between these two assets, we have over 100 kilometers of major structures identified, several of which we're the first to identify. Uh, the assets are about 70 kilometers, about 45 miles apart from one another. So naturally, they actually live together from a logistical standpoint in a modern mining context. And the geology of these two is actually quite complementary. So Tonkilia, which is the furthest to the south, is a, a, is a sort of characterized by a very large kilometers wide shear zone system. So we're, here we're looking for big, broad bulk, highly continuous mineralization, where we can have big bulk, high efficiency open pits. And so really looking for unit efficiencies in terms of the costs of blasting, lifting, uh, moving and processing material. <clears throat> and then when you look to Tarkula, just 70 kilometers to the north, this is actually an historical shallow high grade district. So this is where South Australia had its gold rush and it's sort of uh, shallower, narrower, much higher grade near surface material. And it essentially can become a high grade satellite that is feeding into and averaging up the grade 
ENA Tonkelia project. But the way that we see these things evolving is while these two would naturally operate together in time and sort of the middle distance, if you will, uh, we have the ability to separate them and to actually take Tarkula as a viable potential stage one option. So we can take Tarkula, pair that with our existing central Gawler mill and bring forward operations. So the focus for us now is to continue scaling uh, the overall size of these, these things, but now we're also accelerating uh, what we hope will be multiple zones of high grade mineralization at Tarkula across this gold field because this material has processed through our mill in 2017 and 2018 very efficiently. Uh, we understand, you know, we have proven uh, logistics, proven metallurgy, proven infrastructure. We have a fully permitted mining lease around an existing pit. <clears throat> so if we can establish, say, two or three years of mill throughput there, then we can start that operation using our mill, start generating cash flow, re-rate the company from, say, explorer, developer into producer, and then generate, uh, take that cash flow and expand into Tonkelia, where you then have a second, much larger, even much more efficient mill. And then you'd be able to use our existing current mill to sort of absorb the region in terms of toll milling operations or uh, even acquiring other projects. So for us, it is a staged de-risked approach to doing things. And that is how we think we get there with far less dilution uh, than you might typically see in the market for a project development pipeline like this. One of the reasons that we are so focused on Tonkilia as that sort of anchor for that middle distance, you know, sort of middle distance, medium term, large scale uh, uh, sort of development objective or production objective is that when we look across the market, uh, and this is something that sort of North American and European markets will be more familiar with than Australia, which is now a tendency to be a high grade underground mine jurisdiction. Um, when we look across the market, big, broad, bulk, high efficiency open pits work better than anything everywhere all the time. Uh, and as I, as I said earlier, you know, really uh, mining is really the volumetric efficiencies of blasting and lifting and moving and processing brought to life. And so we actually look at uh, one group in Australia really is the leader here that we are emulating in terms of the way that we're building this asset and the way that we think about how we might develop it. And this is a group called Capricorn, uh, Capricorn Metals. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with them, uh, they acquired a project called the Carla Winda project back in 2015. And it's a project that we had watched as sort of investors privately uh, and then when we were looking at the Tonkili asset, we started to see some early technical indications of some similarities in how they were evolving that asset and the data that was suggesting to us that potentially Tonkili could evolve the same way. So they acquired uh, Carla Winda as a 650,000 ounce asset back in 2015. And then they sort of methodically and systematically grew that to a 900,000 ounce asset, a 1.1 million ounce, 1.3, 1.5 million ounces. And then fast forward to today, it's about a 2.2 million ounce asset at a 0 0.7 gram per ton resource, which of course we would think of as, well, gee, that's, you know, uh, that, that's a much lower grade resource than you typically hear of in Australia. But <clears throat> they have focused on the sort of uh, efficiencies of scale here. They built a 5 million ton per annum plant. Uh, and that is now Australia's lowest cost gold producer on a quarterly basis. So they produce an ounce of gold there at an all in sustaining cost of 1,300 and uh, $15 Australian per ounce at a, a uh, normalized run rate of around 120,000 ounces per annum. So 120,000 ounces per annum, uh, US dollar cash cost around $850 in terms of an all in sustaining capital, uh, all in sustaining capital cost production. Uh, and that makes them about a $1.6 billion company today. So we really have a, a quite a good role model to follow here. And, you know, following uh, them, we are, we, we, you know, not so jokingly refer to them as our development heroes in this space. Um, we acquired Tonkilia in the end of 2019, early 2020 uh, as a 550,000 ounce asset. In October 2020, we grew it to a 965,000 ounce asset. Uh, in April of this year, we grew to 1.15 million ounces. Uh, and then just recently this week, we grew it to 1.38 million ounces. So we're sort of systematically following kind of exactly the growth progression uh, that Capricorn uh, took with Carla Winda. And, uh, you know, we hope that continues, of course. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, outstanding exploration that we think could really propel further growth in the asset. So when we dial in on that last golden dot there for us, which is our recent uh, update, 
what we see is a continued progression in the growth of the footprint of this mineralization. So <clears throat> what we have had during the 2023 calendar year is a total growth of just over 400,000 ounces of gold in this deposit. And to put this in context, when we look at the long section here of the wireframes of the mineralization, the if you if you imagine everything in uh, in red, just sort of ignore the red wireframes for a minute. Everything else, this sort of orange and purple and brown and gray and yellow and blue, those were the sort of original wireframe uh, uh, domains, the sort of mineralized domains in that deposit. And in 2020 and 2023. Uh, we connected those uh, up, we rationalized them, extended them to depth, smoothed the base of the mineralization, and really created a much more rational and uniform resource in sort of two stages, which gave it the baseline to become a potential big, broad, sort of bulk, uh, open pit style uh, body of mineralization. And then quite recently, uh, with our drilling programs that we actually started only just in the beginning of September this year, we have added the wireframes that you see in red. So we've identified a, an offset, a sort of extension to the north, which is on the left side of your screen, a new and offset body of mineralization to the southeast. And then further to the north, there's a completely separate and brand new area, which is called 223 North. Uh, the, the deposit is 223 deposit. The uh, red wireframe to the leftmost on your screen is 223 North. We have brought that from confirmation of being a new gold zone about two years ago into New York Resource now. So progressively smooth to depth, and now we've grown it out. <clears throat> the most recent upgrade for us is about a 20% growth, both in tons and ounces. Uh, and the net result, uh, as I mentioned, is we've grown this deposit about 400,000 ounces during 2023. And importantly, uh, yeah, I think a very important metric for us rather than just the absolute growth is the efficiency of that growth. We have grown uh, or sort of obtained those ounces at an all-in cost of around $14 Australian uh, per ounce. That's an all-inclusive cost. So it's drilling an assay and field uh, personnel and logistics and even you know the modeling costs of declaring the resource with a third-party independent consultant. So this is very, very efficient growth. Uh, and that's been very, re very rewarding for us. <clears throat> and some of the characteristics that come out of this and how we think about this, uh, now we're looking at a long section which shows a combination of sort of the, the 2020, the, 20, the April 2023, and the December 2023 pit shells, uh, or sorry, we should say, sorry, mineral resource estimate shells, so JORC mineral resource estimate uh, shells. So these, these are, these are uh, pit optimized constrained resources. These aren't the infinity resources. They do continue below the declared resource. <clears throat> but you can see here uh, how these these uh, uh, MRE shells have evolved over time. Uh, and that concept of this very efficient drilling, uh, we invested, for example, about $3.6 million in the drilling that has gone into this new resource upgrade uh, since the beginning of September. So very significant, but very targeted investment, which has yielded a very high uh, number of ounces per meter drilled and a very low cost uh, uh, low cost per ounce added. This has moved now about, uh, this has now created about nearly an 800,000 ounce indicated resource. <clears throat> so something that we can look at putting into a study and potentially converting into a reserve. And one of the key things to take away from this is sort of the guiding principle for us is sort of conservative modeling with a production mentality. So when we look at this, we actually impose very strict grade capping on all of those different wireframe domains. So we do our, our, our statistical analyses of the distribution of samples. We, we, we grade cap or we cut off um, very sort of nuggety, uh, high nuggety or, or, or spiky values in, in assays. And that brings us back to a more conservative resource estimate with the objective that we are looking at um, the ability to have perhaps outperformance both in the number of ounces, but also in the grade. So, the, so the, the operational performance as we get into big bulk open pit. And one thing you can see on this slide is there is a concentration of much higher grade dots towards the center of this deposit. So when we started working on this, we had a theory that there is a higher grade core. We have since validated that through several rounds of drilling and modeling. <coughs> and so we're continuing to build value there. And in parallel, we're building value in the company. So we have gone through 
and unlocked not only several new gold zones, uh, but we're getting a lot of support in from the state of South Australia. Again, quite keen for us to become sort of a leader in unlocking this area, unlocking a new, uh, essentially reproving an existing gold district. Um, but we're also going through and generating a lot of cash from our assets. So we're on track to generate about $10 million in additional non-dilutive cash from these assets uh, across our work for the past two and a half years with the net result that, you know, while we continue to uh, systematically build these resources, uh, we have uh, in the past two and a half years since IPOing, we've only done one small placement, which was responsive to the request of several institutions to join our register. Uh, we raised about 4.7, uh, sorry, 4.7 million Australian dollars in June, 2023 after our last resource upgrade. And so our IPO shareholders from two and a half years ago still own about 95% of our business, uh, which obviously, again, is a unique sort of differentiator for us in the market. So <clears throat> stepping into the assets, going back to Tonkilia, we're zooming in now. This is a, sort of a project plan uh, of the uh, project area there. And again, this was really characterized by shallow historical drilling. We've now grown this project and this mineralization uh, in terms of the actual Jork resources, <coughs> pardon me, uh, three times since October, 2020. Uh, we've more than doubled the gold mineralized strike of the project. That's included three new satellite areas, which are area 51, area 191 and 223 North. That 223 North has now entered a uh, Jork deposit classification. Again, this has been efficient. Uh, we uh, are targeting more growth here uh, and we've continued to really step out. And what we're testing now is not only, uh, you know, the existing 223 deposit, we're working on converting those new satellite gold zones that we've already confirmed into Jork resources, but we're also now stepping out and testing down strike or long strike targets. This is a major structural trend, a big shear zone. Uh, we have a new target, which we just uh, did about 4,000 meters in drilling on. So very serious test called the Southeast offset target. And you see that in the bottom right uh, corner of this slide. Uh, and that is really testing a quite a significant geophysical anomaly in a model that we've built in house and trained on this geology over the past several years. Uh, it's been quite successful uh, in terms of being predict uh, predictive of mineralization so far. Uh, and we have about 4,000 meters of assays outstanding from that yet to come in uh, during the end of January and early February. <clears throat> Looking back at that 223 deposit again, there's kind of some very interesting characteristics that are starting to come out of this in terms of a potential development model. So on the left side of your screen, you see sort of a three-dimensional, that's that wireframe model turned into three dimensions there. Um, and there's sort of three key characteristics to take away from this uh, when you look at that model in the cross section on the right. One is that while we model our resources to uh, 300 meters depth, you know, we're focused on bulk open pits, so we cut them off at that depth about 80% of the resources are within uh, sort of 200 meters of surface. So there's a, a, within that limitation, there's a bias to shallow. And then when we look at the deposit, if you actually draw a cross section right through the middle of the main part of the deposit there, uh, that is the cross section you see on the screen on the right. And what we have identified and validated is that there's about a 300 meter long higher grade core within that deposit. And what you can see there is that is basically 80 to 100 meter mining widths. This is where the sort of six main domains of mineralization, they actually come together and form this very robust body for big bulk uh, open pit mining, you know, 80 to 100 meters, you know, for, you know, some visual context, this is a football field tipped and on and wide. This will be very big, very broad, very bulk mining in terms of unit efficiencies. But within that, we have sort of 20 to 30 meters of higher grade mineralization. And you can see two shapes there, which reflect mining blocks or resource blocks that are grading not an average of gram, one gram per ton, but uh, two to five and five to 10 grams per ton. So you have a bias to value towards the center and naturally you have to pick a point to start developing an asset. So you would be developing a higher grade central starting point on that deposit. And then the third key feature is that when you are opening the pit to the north and to the south, uh, you are then working through that blue feature, which is a super gene sequence, uh, which hosts about 277,000 ounces of gold. So you're actually being paid to do the pre-strip to set up for the rest of bulk mining. So that's a very nice sort of geometry of the geology, if you will, for us. 
And then when we then step back out, everything that we've looked at there is just in that sort of green box in terms of the project area where we have actively declared resources in that red box is that major offset target. But we have another 20 plus kilometers of untested shear here. Uh, and we're really gonna, uh, we're really excited to work our way down this and demonstrate that it is a, a, a proper uh, district scale development opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> we expect to be sharing a lot more exciting news as we go into the early new year. We have about 8,000 meters of drilling results still outstanding from those satellite gold zones and that southeast offset. So hopefully those will come back mineralized. We might be able to add another uh, new Jork resource body to the north, but we're really hoping in particular to open the doors to the south to kind of the next several kilometers of the shear zone, which could be quite transformative for this asset. So if you have, you know, wrapping that up and coming you know, to the Tunkelia concept in totality, if you have a series of big bulk open pits uh, where you can have really efficient open pit mining, you love to have nearby some shallow high grade gold that you can take and use as high grade feature satellite. And this is where we step again, back 70 kilometers to the north, looking at the Tarkula project. So <clears throat> Tarkula, uh, named after a little township that was there, <clears throat> this is an, uh, a project area that's right at the junction of the Sydney, Adelaide, Perth, and Darwin Railway. So really right at the heart of Australian infrastructure. This is also the heart of South Australian high-grade gold. So this project where we have this ground was actually the, the site of the 1893 gold rush. Uh, the mining lease that we have is where there's about 600 historical high-grade workings uh, where people were there mining artisanally with you know picks and shovels, a bit of dynamite. Uh, but they mined about 77,000 ounces uh, during the early 1900s, which is not an altogether large number of ounces, but they were doing that at about an average of 37.5 gram per ton from essentially shallow, uh, very nuggety quartz veins coming to surface. And they sort of mined across the fingertips, if you will, because you can only go so deep if you don't have, for example, giant steam pumps in the middle of nowhere to handle water. <clears throat> so... If you fast forward 100 years, uh, a small open pit was actually put around one of those uh, deep high grade shafts as well, sorry, shallow high grade shafts as well. Um, and that produced gold uh, in bulk for at, during 2017 and 2018 to our central Gawler mill. Uh, and the, in 2018, the, the production grade was on average about 3.8 gram per ton or sent to our mill. So we are dialing in on that mine now. Uh, we're building a new regional model around here. We're actually the first people to model the subsurface architecture and we're mapping out new large scale systems that we are now leaning into to say, okay, let's accelerate the delineation of some high grade gold that again, can be a nice feeder into blending up Tonkilia, but accelerate stage one operations using our mill. When we look at the pit that's there, uh, this is the pit that was dug around one of those historical shafts. It's a very shallow pit. Uh, it was about uh, 70 meters deep in the uh, Southwest end at its deepest point, about 30, 35 meters deep in the North. And this pit is, uh, is only about 400 meters long but it produced you know, somewhere close to 50,000 ounces of gold. So a very significant, very rich, uh, uh, shallow soup bowl full of gold, if you will. And uh, we actually have come in and drilled below the pit floor and extended the known mineralization or the extent of that mineralization up to 200 meters below the pit floor. Um, but interestingly, in the pit floor, there's some very high grade uh, historical intercepts that we are now following up and drilling in the pit floor. And we've also identified a new gold zone which we call Perseverance West. And this sits just behind the Southern pit wall. So the idea here is we may have some very interesting potential to, you know, in a pit that has already produced say 50,000 ounces from very shallow pit, add another sort of 30, 40 to 50,000 ounces, just as simple extensions to the strike length of the pit and in the immediate pit floor. So that mineralization could be very high value to us because this was essentially a walk up, restart, nil pre capex open pit. But where this model gets more interesting is when we look at the work we started doing about three and a half years ago in terms of that regional geological model. So we identified the structure using seismic data that feeds that pit. And we've we've got a big a big bold line on the image on this uh, slide here. And you can see that's the, that's the Perseverance Fault. So that fault passes down through the Tarkula Basin. It's a sedimentary basin. Uh, that is the source of mineralization uh, in this region. And because it's a sedimentary basin, it actually has yielded very interesting uh, uh, visibility and reflectivity in seismic analysis. So we can see that fault passing through that basin and plumbing directly into this uh, red outline structure we can see, which is a, which is an intrusive granite. It's 
part of the Hiltupa suite of intrusives. It's the same engines of growth. So the, so, you know, the bringing of pressure and heat and fluids up to structures, uh, which we see over to the east underneath the IOCG province. So Olympic Dam, prominent Nolan Carapatina. Um, but the important takeaway here is that where you've got that perseverance mine on the right hand side, we've identified essentially a 15 kilometer long field of structures that are sort of parallel and cross, cross cutting that look analogous to that structure. So they pass through the same basin and they actually plumb into the same exact intrusive bodies. And when you look to the westernmost side of this image, and this is image represents about 15 kilometers in strike length, this is that historical Tarkula Goldfield. So this is the first look at what is the actual architecture which ties all this together and explains why there's these 600 shallow high-grade workings. And on the western side there, uh, we have a, uh, one prospect which we uh, have identified called Warburton. And that's, a, that's actually a prospect where Anglo Gold drilled a hole in 1998, uh, and they drilled 16 meters around three and a half grams per ton uh, from surface. Now, they didn't follow that up for two reasons. One, they didn't understand the structural context. They hadn't done this work. But two, of course, the gold price was falling. So it wasn't good enough to keep going. But for us, we have a very interesting Western bookend in that exploration result and a very interesting Eastern bookend in our mining lease, which has produced around 125,000 ounces of gold at an average grade of 25 gram per ton across the past 120, 130 years. And two weeks ago, uh, just before our resource update, uh, we published this. So this is the evolution of that two-dimensional model into an actual very interesting detailed three-dimensional interpretation of that subsurface architecture. And this is the first time in 130 years that you can take all of these historical high grade and more importantly, the bigger footprints of historical gold mineralization or production in that Tarkula gold field and put it in a consistent structural framework. And what we see, what's exciting about this is that these main events, uh, main gold mineralized events occur consistently in relation to three or four key features and are in particular associated with the more vertical and deeper tapping structures that look the most like that perseverance fault. So that now gives us a tool to really specifically work against and dial in on. And we are gonna be following this up very aggressively during early 2024, not only to keep drilling in that pit, but to go out and test on both our existing mining lease and the immediate neighboring exploration license, several targets that one have previously been recognized, but there are also several locations that comply with these say four guiding principles of where you think you might find big gold mineralization that might be just under two or three or four meters of cover, but have never been tested. So we think this is a very exciting tool and we're gonna be following this up quite aggressively during 2024. So in parallel with that, let's step away from the projects. Again, we'll continue monetizing assets. We expect to sell our $4 million with the gold concentrates uh, in some time in the next several months. We are looking at doing things like even processing some of our existing stockpiles adjacent to our mill. Uh, of course, we are working consistently with government agencies to see if we can get grants and other tax incentives. All of these things generate and recycle cap capital back to us uh, through, uh, through and supporting more R&D style initiatives, which have allowed us to accelerate exploration, which have in turn allowed us to come up with some very interesting ways to target structure, target mineralization, and yield these types of growth results in a very cost-efficient and accelerated basis. So it's a very important part for us on the exploration side. It's also a very important part for us in terms of mitigating the amount of dilution or capital that we would look to raise from the public markets as we take these steps forward. So <clears throat> that is the sort of the conclusion of the detail. Uh, the, the moral of the story, the conclusion for us is uh, we have had an incredibly busy 2023. Uh, we've had gold sales. Uh, we've had uh, several new institutions join, so join us. We've had two significant resource upgrades at Tonkilia. Looking forward into 2024, as I mentioned, we have sort of preset, uh, preset a lot of exploration activities already. We have a very substantial pipeline of assay results due to come in the end of January, early to mid-February. Hopefully that will turn into another, a third uh, resource upgrade in 12 months for Tonkilia during uh, during sort of the March period of time. Uh, and then we are also going to be drilling, uh, following that up and continuing to grow Tonkilia, keep crystallizing that scale, Tarkula, accelerate some of that high grade mineralization to accelerate 
that's sort of stage one uh, conceptual planning, and then we'll keep unlocking value on the corporate front. Uh, so it really, you know, for us in summary, uh, we're working at speed. Uh, we have a pretty interesting platform, uh, quite robust. It gives us a lot of optionality. Uh, we are growing it very quickly. We are well capitalized to do so. We have very strong development pathways. We have a very experienced team, which really reflects sort of a, a much larger organization. And of course, we've got quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of news coming up in terms of really uh, material catalysts that we see on the horizon in terms of resource growth, hopefully some new discoveries, continued asset sales, continued gold production. Uh, and we have made ourselves quite accessible. We're listed our home exchange on the Australian Stock Exchange or Australian Securities Exchange. We're also listed on the OTCQB and the Frankfurt Stock Exchanges. So uh, we have made this much more accessible to our international investors who've been joining us uh, quite progressively over the past sort of 12 and 24 months. So uh, with that, thank you very much for uh, listening to me rabbit on uh, for the past half hour. And I'll hand back to Tim. Great. Thank you very much, Alex, for the informative presentation. Uh, we'll now start the Q&A portion of this webinar. A reminder to everyone on the line that you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. Uh, we already do have a few questions. Um, you had spoken about monetizing assets, it was mainly in reference to uh, cleaning out the mill and maybe some equipment and things. Would you also consider monetizing any of the, the tenements? Look, that's a good question. Um, I think, I think, uh, from, from our perspective, uh, really what you'd be going to and thinking about that is, would you be looking at monetizing perhaps a project or, or, or subset of projects? Because we were very careful in selecting these tenements. Uh, it wasn't sort of a general broad-based application uh, approach or sort of acquisition application. Uh, where we've acquired tenements, we've acquired them because they are the historical core of proven, uh, uh, proven high-grade production or the largest base of known undeveloped gold resource in South Australia. So the Tonkilia project is the largest undeveloped pure gold resource in South Australia. So um, we've been selective and we're not just maintaining a giant sort of uh, elephantine portfolio. Um, we probably are more on the acquisitive side of looking at new tenements as opposed to the dispositive side. And the reason for that is with a lot of the work that we're doing. So we, we are working with uh, e even uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning systems and platforms. We're actually transforming some of these models with, uh, with our technology partners from different domains that are focused on say outcropping mineralization to this domain, which is a subcropping or undercover domain to see if we can tune those, identify areas that have never been looked at because they might have two meters of cover you, you know, people then stub their toe on gold sticking out of the surface and then looking at selectively acquiring certain tenements that we think could unfold and actually fill in the picture for us. We want to gain efficiencies in scale. And that is not only within a single deposit, but also with sort of, sort of a, a satellite or constellation theory around having not currently, sorry, having currently one, but eventually two mills that would be about 200 kilometers apart from one another. And if you can fill in a series selectively fill in and, and cheaply maintain a series of tenements yielding a lot of gold, that's where you get that real condensation of value, that real concentration of economics. Uh, so for us, we are probably more on the uh, the big, angry, hungry, hungry hippo mentality, but with a, a, with a restrained appetite instead of what we actually pull the trigger on. Okay, great. Now, you'd mentioned that you're looking to start work on a scoping study in the first half of uh, 2024. Uh, what would the timing of that look like? Uh, one question was, would it be fair to assume uh, that the study would be released in early 2025? Uh, so, you know, a scoping study is a bit faster than that. Um, <clears throat> when we think about the information we have on the Tonkilia project, so when we think about a scoping study, uh, you obviously have to have an adequate base of information to uh, start scoping what you think indicative economics could look like. And of course, you know, for your viewers, it's important for us to also articulate that a scoping study is not a feasibility study. There is a different level of work and confidence interval there. So scoping studies tend to be on the order of, you know, the plus or minus 50, throw it up and see, you know, could this actually work within reasonable assumptions, assuming A, B, C, and D? And then as you move into feasibility, you're getting into more quoted costs 
uh, you're tightening down that uh, that uh, uncertainty uh, interval to sort of plus or minus 35 until you end up with the more definitive feasibility study, which used to be called a bankable, uh, where you're sort of plus or minus 15%. So we actually have a great deal of historical data on this asset. We have hydrolog hydrological studies. We have metallurgical studies. So <clears throat> we actually are in a position to do a fairly advanced scoping or preliminary economic analysis. And that's something that we've actually been talking about internally, you know, having grown the deposit twice during 2023 and quite materially with then a number of pending results that could result again in a further growth during say March, we're actually looking at potentially a PEA style analysis or scoping style analysis during the first half of 2024. And then that gives us additional guidance for where do we aim from here in terms of growing certain zones, uh, continued scaling, optimization of a potential project plan. And then you're doing the gap analysis that sets you up for feasibility studies and that's where you might see those carry on as a sort of six to 12 month study and take you into 2025, but then give you something that's a much more, uh, essentially that's the basis by which to start locking in mining lease applications, locking in uh, environmental approvals uh, and starting to advance uh, development planning on that basis. Great. And looking on the personnel side, could you uh, speak more about the depth of human capital and expertise on your team, especially to potentially operate a producing mine? Yeah, look, uh, you know, uh, we, we sort of went across it briefly on that page and, 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 and the, on the sort of leadership page we have there, we really feature kind of only eight people. We've built a team that has not only a great deal of experience in its leadership, <clears throat> but also a great deal of experience in you know, the balance of the team. And we have a combination of, I, I think you'd say, both both depth with people, but then a breadth of expertise. And that's that's really important. So we, you know, we really do focus on people first and foremost. And then in our end of the field, you know, the, the smaller capitalized companies that are more looking forward towards production rather than running a company. I think we are I think we have a team that, you know, in my opinion, in terms of uh, its performance. Uh, this is a team that has a very clear united vision. They've got a lot of experience developing and delivering these types of things in the future. Um, and I think we've put together a team that really is second to none. You know, we're not we're not sort of a uh, just a traditional explorer where you know at a fifty million dollar market capitalization you might have a really just core geological team but you start to get thin on the development expertise or the infrastructure expertise or the financial expertise. And the, the, on the financing side of things, structured finance, uh, mine finance, development finance, that's sort of my domain, but it's also a domain who was the CFO for Normandy Mining, ran their financing portfolios, ran their, you know, the, their hedging portfolios. We have people who specialize in building mills. We have some of the best gold and copper explorationists in South Australia. And they, as explorationists, as geologists, have also taken multiple projects through scoping and feasibility, permitting and development in, not, in, in, a, in a wide suite of minerals in South Australia and have also had experience in state government, so inside the department. So <clears throat> it's sort of layers of experience that's all complementary. Uh, and I think that puts us in the best position possible to move forward from the sort of theory into the planning, into the execution. Great. And one question here, obviously this is uh, projecting in the future, but if you do become a, a producer and, and uh, you know, cash generating, would you ever consider uh, paying out a dividend? Certainly. Yeah. Look, I, I have to say, um, uh, you know, and, and Tim, we can, <clears throat> we could talk for days about this, this kind of theory. And, and, and we have had these conversations in the past is, you know, one of the one of the legitimate criticisms of the gold industry today, and, and, and of course, it's particularly easy to throw a spear like this in a market where gold equities have have been out of favor, sort of cyclically out of favor for the past sort of two or three years. So almost almost sort of like a very long season of people not paying attention is, you know, one of the reasons for that or one of the things that's really contributed to that is despite an increase in gold price, you know, the larger companies have, have done two things uh, or not done two things well. One, they haven't really kept control 
of their sustaining capital and inflationary cost base. And so they've seen their, their production costs increase or their profit margin. If, if the gold price was the same, they would have seen their profit margin erode quite a bit while the gold price is going up. <clears throat> but the second thing they've not done well is, is actually to return capital to investors, right? And the objective here in really, really simple terms, we are burying money into the ground to identify where we can get more money and get it out of the ground. We are taking shareholder capital and sticking it on the ground. The novel objective appears to be that we would want to return that money to shareholders, but it's actually not as common or as efficiently done as it should be. And if we want more generalist investors to take more seriously uh, both the mining industry, but you know, the gold industry within that broader mining sector, if we want generalist investors to participate more seriously in the industry, which on a basic mathematical basis would be wildly transformative for the value of, of mining equities, uh, mining companies need to behave more like uh, uh, you know something that has a much more limited resource, you know, as opposed to oil and gas companies. We don't tend to find 50 year deposits. So we have to be better at putting money in, better at developing and better at returning that capital to reward the shareholders who took the extraordinary risk of you know buying this type of share as opposed to just buying government bonds absolutely great well i think that's all the questions we have um i guess one question i would ask uh, kind of reiterating because you did have the slide with the uh, plans going forward but to just to review what news and a catalyst would we expect uh, from Barton in the coming months? So uh, we have the, the resource upgrade that we've just put out reflects the acceleration of a subset of the sort of done uh, over 20,000 meters of drilling since the beginning of September. So in 14 weeks, our team mobilized multiple rigs in the field, drilled, assayed, analyzed, and returned a jork resource. Which is, a, <clears throat> which is a blinding uh, speed of return in terms of generating a JORC resource. Uh, that I really, I really tip my hat to the team. There's a lot of people pulling together to make that happen. But th that is actually represents about half of the drilling results. So we still have half of the drilling results relating to, on the one hand, a, a bit of drilling in the pit floor of Tarkula to work out what's happening with the structure there. We'll get some of those results back. Uh, but really at Tonkilia, that Area 51, that uh, they have the main two to three deposit, and there's a gap, and then you have that area 51 uh, gold zone there. We have a large number of diamond and RC drilling results pending to come there. So that core uh, diamond drilling, of course, takes much larger to cut the core and assay and analyze the core. <clears throat> that is all expected to come back at the end of January, early February. And then that Southeast offset target, that one is very exciting for us. So this is the first time that we have uh, we built our predictive geophysical model for what we're looking for is basically a very specific slice of the geophysical signature that we see running throughout that domain there we are stepping outside of the box within which we have essentially been playing and tuning that model so we're stepping into a new sandbox and if those two very long lines that we drill there, this 4,000 meters of, of drilling is a very serious preliminary test of a very significant geophysical uh, signature that we're seeing. If that comes back gold mineralized, that's very significant. That means we have sort of jumped the gap on a major structure that interrupts the deposit with that target zone. So we would essentially have opened the doors to the next several kilometers of the shear zone we're really looking at that as a, as a potentially exciting thing for us. We will get those assays back again, hopefully end of January, early February. Uh, and then hopefully we'll turn area 51 into a new jerk resource, potentially in March, by which time we will already be drilling hard again with a focus in particular on some of these shallow high grade targets that we've just mapped out inside of that new 3D architecture of Tarkula. So it's kind of bang, 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 bang. Uh, with any luck, we might actually be able to put a resource uh, on the open pit at Tarkula as well. Uh, so keep crystallizing that sort of stage two big picture scale. Uh, and then as we get into 2024 through 2024, start to really crystallize, hey, the stage one step ladder to you know, a nice easy step to the bigger picture, this is becoming really real because if you have 30 or 40 or 50,000 ounces on that pit, 
that might be sort of stage one, year one and two of production. And if you find two or three more of these areas, uh, we lean into that very, very hard and see if we can't tie this all up during 2024 and really set the table for how we're going to go into development, when, where, how fast. And then, of course, you know, what might that yield from a productivity uh, cost and productivity and profitability basis. So 2023 has been uh, very transformative for us uh, in terms of, you know, the rubber hitting the road and demonstrating, hey, these things, you know, we bought them, we grew 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 them again. They're going to keep growing as we can, if we can crystallize that that stage one Tarkula story, it becomes sort of a real kind of double threat approach for us that we can actually then look at monetizing our mill. So 2024, we hope is actually going to be even more exciting as these things come together. Great. A lot to look forward to. I, certainly, <laughs> certainly. Well, great. So I'd like to uh, thank Alexander Scanlon for presenting today. And thanks everyone on the line for tuning in. Uh, have a great rest of your day and, and a great holiday season. <laughs>